right, Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Aaron, and uh, thanks for returning, everybody. Uh, so now we're going to go through a series of talks to further dive into game expansions and the value of them. In our first talk today, we're going to be talking about game expansions, why they're valuable, as well as several other topics pertaining to it. Um, later on, we're going to talk about production and how you actually plan out and produce these major updated features. In our third section today, we're going to be talking about game balance and how you get the most out of the features you're creating. And finally, in our fourth topic for today, we're going to be talking about how you can further support your feature once it's live. Um, for this section, I will have dedicated areas for questions. And at that time, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and ask questions or to post your questions on Slido. So hopping into our first topic for today, here's an overview of some of the high level topics we're going to be covering. In our first section, we're going to be talking about live ops and game expansions and what they mean for our game. Uh, in the second section, we're going to be talking about how you can support your core loop with your game expansion. And finally, we're going to be talking about how you can make your content renewable. So diving on in, you might hear the word live ops a lot, but might not know what it means. This is why I'm here to help. Let's dive in and talk about each of the components of live ops. So contrary to popular belief, a lot of people think that once you ship your game, that's the finish line. You're done, your game is out there, now all of your players can enjoy. That might have been true 20 years ago with a box product that you sell, costs $20, somebody buys it, they bring it home and they play it. But in this new era where we have free to play games, you're really delivering your game as a service. You wanna be continually updating it, you wanna continually be adding new content to it to expand your audience and to keep your current audience engaged. This is where Live Ops comes in. So we can break down live ops into two and a half, maybe three components. Our first is content cadence. So another way to think of this is as your weekly or bi-weekly updates where you're releasing new content into the game. Christmas is coming up, you release new cosmetics, you release a new pet, you release new furniture for your house. Um, you know, you decide to have an event in April for egg hunt, you release content for that as well. Ideally with content cadence, you're leveraging systems that already exist in your game. So there's no real new tech that you need to be building. You're just leveraging the systems that already exist and you're adding new content that allow players to customize their world. So what you're going to see with your metrics if you take a look at your weekly updates is that it's going to sustain your player base over time, right? And so where players might lose interest towards the tail end of the week, you release a new update and that further expands you know, your audience, or it brings them back to see what new content is there. Our second piece of content and why we're here today are called game expansions. So whereas our content cadence maintains our player base over time, our game expansions greatly grow our player base and are really good for our business. With these updates, because there's a lot of new tech and uh, moving parts that are involved in them, they typically take a bit longer to create and so I would expect that for a live game, you typically want to target at least one of these releases a quarter. Um, obviously, this is going to highly depend on your team's bandwidth, the number of people that you have on your team, what you're capable of doing. So while I say content cadence is weekly, that depends on your team. And similarly with game expansions, you should be doing what is sustainable and possible for your team to do. So our third kind of update typically falls into one of these two categories and it's our quality of, of life updates. These are bug fixes, improvements to our user experience, polish for features that already exist. And the main purpose of this is to continue creating goodwill with our players. When you're doing quality of life updates, you show your players that you care, that you wanna improve their experience and it really just contributes to player loyalty to your game. So obviously this can fall into just something that you slip in into a weekly update where you're fixing some bugs, or you could have an entire expansion that's dedicated to improving some sort of poor user experience that you have in your game. So now that that's out of the way, let's dive into our topic for today, which are our game expansions. And let's talk about some of the benefits that come from working on these larger, more ambitious updates. First is that this is a bold and ambitious new piece of content. Whereas your content cadence is something for players to express themselves with one another. These features are meant to change how your players think about your game and change how they interact with your game. 
because if a player is logging in every day and doing the exact same thing, what you're going to find is over time, they're going to get bored and they're going to drop your game. These pieces of content are built to be sustainable, evergreen pieces of content. You're going to be hearing me say this a lot today, but you should never be spending one to three months of resources on your team for something that you're going to ship and then just leave to die in your game. That doesn't make any sense. This is something that is meant to be set up to have a lot of investment into. And then once it's live, you can roll it into your content cadence and you can start to leverage those systems to deliver new content to your players. With your game expansions, it's not always a hard rule, but typically they're going to introduce new forms of play. They're going to introduce new economies or resources to your game. They're going to introduce new game mechanics. They might even have an overhaul of the world where let's say we're moving from fall to winter and you want that to reflect on your map. So you're going to do a major event you know, to broadcast that to your community. And finally, and if I haven't demonstrated this already, your major updates are critical for the long-term success of your game. You can only maintain your player base for so long with just regular routine updates every week, but it's really these new ambitious pieces of content that are going to further grow your player base and to reactivate old players who might've dropped off in the lulls between the update. So why game expansions? Why should you even bother with these? We've talked about it a lot already, but you wanna be growing your game. Expansions are exciting. Expansions change up how the player is thinking about the game. Expansions give players something to look forward to months ahead so that they're constantly checking back into your game to see what is new. There's also a lot of feature virality. So when you have those new ambitious pieces of content, there's these great moments of joy that players share with one another and can subsequently have a ton of other players drawn to the game to check out what everybody is talking about. Expansions keep players engaged. So after they've consumed all of the content in the previous month or three months, now they have new content to drive towards. And the name of the game for the lifetime of your game is always setting up short, medium, and long-term goals for your players. Expansions often fit that medium to long-term goal for your players, where they give them a new thing to think about when they're not playing the game, which is what am I doing tomorrow? What am I doing a month from now? Expansions are great for development team morale. We're all very creative people. Uh, if we're constantly just reskinning things and shipping them in our weekly releases, that's going to get boring for us. And so really these expansions are our time to shine. Uh, this is when we allow our creative juices to flow, where we can build uh, team morale with one another through sharing our passion about these experiences and creating these experiences for everyone to enjoy. As I alluded to earlier, game expansions create new vectors of content for updates. So remember, in our content cadence, we wanna be leveraging systems that already exist. So after we've invested all the time into this expansion and released it, we can now leverage that system to release new content into the game. And finally, and maybe the one that devs love the most, monetization. You're not gonna find another aspect of your game that's gonna monetize as well as that initial burst of content that you have in these game expansions. So again, it's critical for the growth of your game and for the monetization of your game. So moving on, we're gonna hop into our core loop. I know I've mentioned it a lot. I know Red Manta mentioned it a lot, but when you're working on your game expansions, you should always be keeping your core loop in mind. You wanna be integrating this content in with your core loop in some meaningful way that continues to drive the player to engage with the core actions of your game. You wanna to avoid tumors at all costs when you're working on these game expansions. And we're gonna dive into this deeper later on, but the long and the short of it is, a tumor is any system that directly competes for the player's attention with your core loop. You also wanna avoid reinventing the wheel with your game expansions. Why bother you know, working on this game and then going back to the drawing board and completely revamping the game and making it a completely different game? Your players are there because they love what's already there. So really just add upon it, build upon it rather than detract. So I've been talking about it a lot, but let's briefly review what is a core loop. So a core loop is our minute to minute interactions when the player is playing the game. This is something that every time they log into the game, they will be interacting with this set of actions in some meaningful way. And as a result, 
if this content is not fun, it doesn't matter what other systems are in your game, your game simply won't be fun because they are forced to interact with your game through this core loop. So if we look to the side here in the example I listed, you could say that this is world zero's core loop. In world zero, you kill monsters, which give you loot, which allow you to upgrade and become stronger so that you can kill more monsters. So you can see for world zero and every game out there, your core loop is your central gameplay. And so you shouldn't try and detract from it. You should try to build upon this core loop. This is the most repeated set of actions that your player has in your game. So you really want to be leveraging that. And through this example, you can see your core loop ends up being the engine through which your entire progression occurs, right? If you look at world zero, you log into the first world, you kill some relatively weak monsters. They give you gold and better equipment, allow you to upgrade so that you can go to world two, so that you can kill even stronger monsters, so that you can loot even better gear, so that you can upgrade, so on and so forth. So let's go into an example and I can show you how for Roblox in high school, they built every system in the game with their core loop in mind. What we have here is Roblox in high school's core loop. You explore the world, you attend classes, and then you customize your character to further drive your engagement and your role play so that you may explore the world, attend classes with your friends and further drive those social relationships. So if we break this down and we take even just a snapshot now of Roblox in high school, we can see how each of the systems fit into this core loop. For exploration, we can ask the questions of where and how. Where does the player go in the world? They can go to the school, which is the primary hub for all of the social interactions in the game. They can go to their home where they can also customize their home. Or simply they could spawn a car and they can drive around the world. Well, how do they explore? Well, there are cars, which is a major draw for both engagement in the game and monetization, and that players are able to buy different cars, customize them, and drive them around. You have skateboards. You also have fast travel. You can immediately travel to the school and start class. You can also directly travel to your friends. Remember that Roblox is the most social platform out there, and so having systems like this where you can allow players to engage with one another uh, is critical to the success of your game. Uh, under the action of attending class, there's several systems that they have here for engaging players. When you go to the designated class, you earn an attendance score, and this will give you coins. You can also do a class activity. This was actually a recent game expansion that they did. They recognized that the interactions in the classroom weren't as meaningful as they wanted them to be. And so to further drive the motivation for players to want to be in the classroom, they added these class activities where one player is designated to be the teacher, they choose the coursework for that day, and then everybody does that coursework. And through simply by virtue being there, that facilitates the social interactions and the role play that the Red Manta developers really wanted their players to engage in. Under customization, this is maybe the bread and butter and the major attraction of the game is when you're a role play game, you wanna allow your players to immerse in the experience as much as possible. And they facilitate that immersion through several systems. They have a house housing system where you can purchase different houses. And this is actually a large monetization driver for them. You have furniture. So even in the interior of the house, you can further customize that to make it new and unique and special to you alone. You can customize your character. This is probably their claim to fame with memes like Despacito Spider, but I would challenge you to log into any Robloxian high school server and not see at least one player who's customizing and creating a new persona. You also have new items. So through getting that gold, you can buy skateboards, you can buy you know, role play props to further drive that socialization experience. So here you have it, right? You have three simple actions that you have, but every system in the game is augmenting one of those actions and facilitating that core loop interaction. So in a similar vein, when you are sitting down and you are brainstorming your new feature that you wanna be working on, the very first question that you should be asking after an idea is pitched is, how does this enhance our core loop? So we gave the example earlier of the classroom coursework, right? And the question they asked is, how do we augment attending classes? Well, they check that box so that they can move on and they continue working on that feature. You could have something as simple as, you know, 
changing up the look of your map. So Robloxina High School does this very well. When it's winter time, they change it to a winter theme. When it's springtime, they change it to a spring theme. Doing simple things like this, although the implementation is not as simple, but doing things like this allow the player to know that this is a living, breathing world and that the developers care about it and are constantly updating it. You don't even have to directly impact a single action in the core loop. You can actually just further motivate players to want to engage in the core loop. And that's what uh, Red Manta successfully did with their grade system. So with the grade system, just by virtue of exploring, attending class, customizing, completing these tasks, right? You are rewarded for doing so. And as a result, they've seen lift in engagement and monetization because players are now further driven to play and socialize with one another in this world. So that brings us back to something I had mentioned earlier, which are tumors and why you want to avoid tumors. But what is a tumor? A tumor is a system that directly conflicts with your core loop or competes for player attention with your core loop. When you're doing this, you're creating indecision and anxiety in your players. Your players are conflicted in which of these they should be spending their time with. And ultimately they're going to choose one over the other, which as a result leaves the other system to atrophy and die. And for you as the developer, this is going to create what Red Manta coined as update debt, where now you have this system that you have to continue to support, even though there's only a small subset of players who actually care about it. So let's revisit Roblox in high school. And let me give you a, albeit kind of cheesy example of what a tumor would look like for Roblox in high school. Let's say that we go back to before the coursework was implemented and we say, hey, our players you know, might not necessarily prefer to attend class. What is a system that we can do? And somebody stands up and says, I know. What if underneath the school, we had a secret fight club where instead of going to these classes, they could go down there they can fight with one another, they can level up, they can learn new abilities and they can further fight one another, right? Well, here is what that looks like on your core loop. Now you're saying, instead of attending class, I'm giving my players the option to either attend class or go to fight club. In best case scenario, what's going to happen here is that you're gonna fork your player base. So in the best case, 50% are going to attend class, and 50% are going to attend Fight Club. But more realistically, one of those two systems is going to be over-indexed in the amount of players that are there. So let's say only 10% now attend class because it's not as exciting, while 90% attend Fight Club. Well, this is ultimately bad for your game because as you can see in that example, one of these systems has one out. And for the small subset of users that have no interest in your Fight Club, as an example, they're gonna to go to class and see that they are the only student or one of two students, and they're going to decide, you know what, this game is no longer for me and I am going to quit. So that's why when you're thinking about how this fits into your core loop, you need to make sure that your system does not directly compete with the attention of the core gameplay. You are called Roblox in high school. So augment the high school experience don't give your players the opportunity to opt out of what you're actually pitching is your game and what your players have already identified is what makes your game special and what makes them enjoy your game. All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk about making our expansions renewable. So expansions are extremely resource intensive. You need to have a lot of programming hours go into it. There's often a lot of artwork that goes into it. There's a lot of planning that goes into it as a designer, as a producer for the feature. You know, So why would you create a feature where once you ship it out, you move on to the next thing and you no longer support it? You should be planning ahead with your feature to think about what the feature is going to look like, not just in the initial update, but maybe in the next two updates, what is the very first update we do for this system after we release it? What is the system going to look like in two years? These are the kinds of conversations that you should have um, when you're actually planning and brainstorming your feature. You should also be thinking about potential themes. If you're planning to bake this into your content cadence and your weekly updates, well, it might be a good opportunity to incorporate this new system you're creating in Christmas in um, the holidays, in um, Halloween, right? What does an update for this feature look like for those systems? You can also think of off-holiday 
features as well. What are some fictional themes that you could tie to this content whenever you're updating it in the future? What does a medieval fantasy themed pet release look like? What does an Area 51 you know, housing system release look like? Give that some thought when you're starting to ideate these ideas for your new feature. Okay, so in this next section, I'm gonna go over some high level types of content that you can release for your major expansions, as well as some examples of each of those. Keep in mind, this is not a hard rule. These are just generally some systems that I've seen in the past that have worked for other developers. So our first and arguably the most important are social systems. Again, Roblox is the most social uh, platform out there. If you've ever witnessed players playing a game, you'll see that they bring in their friends with them to play. So with your expansions, you can give some thought to what are some ways that we can facilitate interactions among players to motivate them to want to be friends, to motivate them to want to return to the game because that's where their friends are hanging out and that's where they like to enjoy their time on Roblox with one another. So with social systems, these typically allow players to meet others with shared interests more easily, and it rewards them for doing so. It rewards them for either socializing with one another, working together towards some common goal, or playing with one another. Our second type of system are competitive systems. So obviously, as the name suggests, these are any systems that allow players to compete with one another in some aspect of the game. Now, often when people think about a competitive system, they directly think of one player fighting another, but these systems don't necessitate that there is combat. And actually, more frequently, they don't involve combat versus they do. You can think of you know, the nicest game out there and you still have your type A and your type B personalities where your type A always wanna be the best at whatever it is. So competition for them might mean the best dressed avatar the best, the cutest pet that they have, um, you know, a flower smelling competition, whatever it is, any time that you can pit them at doing some action better than somebody else, they're going to further engage with your game in order to do so. And finally, with this, your competitive systems are going to reward players for being the best or being among the best. A third type of expansion content are collections and player achievements. So similar to the season update, these are anything that leverage existing systems but may motivate players to consume the content in different ways. Very often with these systems, you're giving them a challenge where they might be interacting with an obby or with a pet or with you know, whatever action is in your game in a way that they never thought about doing so before. And so in that way, without having to build any new content for that system, you're having that player play with that system in a way they've never experienced before. Typically with these, if you have your own hard currency for your game, it's an excellent way to give out that hard currency as a drip every single day. So the player completes the set amount of limited tasks that they have each day, and they're granted this reward that motivates them to want to develop a habit and a routine of returning to your game to at minimum get these tasks done every day. And finally, the last type of expansion content I'm gonna cover are your live events. So this motivates your players to gather at specific times and specific places in your world for exclusive events and rewards. These are what we would call the closest thing to viral marketing for our games because you create this anticipation that this event is going to occur. Everyone's going to gather and socialize. Again, socialization is important and celebrate the release of this feature. And then you're going to have these great moments of joy where whatever effort you put in and whatever experience you created is shared among players in your world. So with that overview in mind, let's dive in deeper and let's talk about examples of each of these systems, starting with our social system examples. The most common one that you might find outside of Roblox, although there are examples on Roblox as well, are guilds or alliances. These are structured systems for individuals to socialize with one another in your game. And often within these systems, you can have something as uh, low implementation as simply allowing them to display the club that they're in, or something as advanced as having you know, another system involved in this guild system, such as achievement systems or directly competitive systems of one group versus another. The second type of social systems, and this one is wildly popular on Roblox, are trading systems. 
So players can exchange uh, a limited subset of items between one another in the game. So in the most advanced iterations of this, you have what is called an auction house where they can list their items on there and then other players can buy it. But more meaningfully for Roblox, this is simply two players that initiate a trade with one another and decide, you know, trading something of equivalent value with one another. Um, this is where you see popular things like in World Zero trading unique items in there, or maybe even in Adopt Me where players are trading pets constantly. So again, this is a great way to facilitate social interaction and engagement where now instead of simply playing this solo game where they're only collecting pets in your game, now they're not only collecting pets, but then they're trading with one another in order to collect them all. Our third type of social system are our friends gifts. So these are not necessarily an item that you're granting to one another, although it can be, but it's any rewards or benefits that you grant players from playing with one another. So this could be a, a buff that players receive. They get, let's say, 10% experience from running through a world zero dungeon together. Or if they reach a certain milestone with one another, they're granted some exclusive reward in the game. So this can come in a lot of iterations and it's not just items, it's just through facilitating that social interaction that players have with one another. Our fourth type of social system are housing and events. So this allows a player to customize their space and share the experience with one another. Very commonly referred to on Roblox as like parties. This is where after a player has invested a lot of time and effort and energy into customizing their house, they invite everyone over to celebrate. This might also include collaborative building. In fact, this is one of the most popular features in Bloxburg where players can get together and decide what they're building with one another. Again, any way that you can motivate players to want to hang out in a single area with one another, work together to achieve goals, you're gonna further drive engagement and retention for your game, which are arguably two of the most important metrics for your game. Okay, moving on, we're gonna talk about some competitive systems. And the first and the most popular on Roblox are your leaderboards. So players can complete, compete as individuals or groups against one another. And the, the core thing that's going on behind the scenes here is that you're motivating players to want to engage more. And in a way, you're kind of leveraging your players as consumable content for one another. Whereas before you said, hey, go and defeat 10 of these enemies, now, instead of playing against the game, you're saying, go and defeat more enemies than this other player. And that other player is dynamically changing that challenge for you as they see you get ahead of them, and then they're trying to get ahead of you, so on and so forth. So leaderboards are one of the greatest pieces of evergreen content that you can have, because no matter the lifetime of your game, there's always players that want to compete with one another. Your second type, and maybe the most obvious that people think when they think of competitive systems are PVPs, races, or other competitions. So this is where you actually have players battle with one another to be the best. Again, this doesn't have to be combat. It could be a cooking competition. It could be a race. It could be a fashion show. It depends on your genre of game. But I encourage you to think of what is the best competition or the most motivating competition for your players. Okay, our third type of competitive system is our community vote it competition. So similar to the last one, but you're further driving social engagement with your players. So this is typically a more subjective complete, or competition such as fashion, house decor, character design, uh, et cetera. And you allow your players to vote for who they think are the winner or sets of winners, depending on what your reward pool is. So again, this is an excellent way to facilitate both competition and social interactions. Um, any questions on any of these so far before I move on to achievements? All right, so moving on, let's talk about some achievement systems. And the first and the most obvious one are achievements. So achievements grant players rewards and notoriety for engaging in existing systems. Um, and they leverage the existing systems, but may add more player content and alternative ways to engage with those systems. So again, the beautiful thing about achievements is you're not changing or adding any new systems to your game. You're just motivating players to want to engage with those systems for rewards. 
Second one, and we talked about it in our round table, but season passes. These are limited time systems that grant players rewards for certain achievement milestones. Um, and throughout the different seasons, these systems will remain the same. But for you as a developer, the nice thing about this is once you've built it, all you have to do is refresh the rewards in this and launch a new season. So these are very easy to maintain. And it's a great way for you to sort of front load the work. That way you don't have to worry about these weekly updates because your players are engaging with this system while you're working on the next big thing that you want to present. The other nice thing about season passes is that they present several monetization opportunities for players. So you heard Ren Banta talk about it, but you know, at the very beginning of the season and at the very end, players are motivated to want to spend to pass through tiers so that they can get the item sooner or maybe even at all if they fell behind during the season and they want to get all the rewards. Similar to this, maybe not as strong, but very low implementation is your daily and weekly logins. So you see this a lot on Roblox. These are systems that grant the player rewards for consecutively logging into the game. Um, and so this creates this player behavior where even if they don't have a lot of time during the day, they still wanna at least log in, say hi to their friends and collect this reward before they go about their day. So this is a very nice retention mechanic that motivates players to wanna to check in daily with your game. And lastly, you have daily quests. Um, and again, this grants players a set of tasks that they can complete daily. Typically, this is a limited amount of tasks that they can do. And often, if you're targeting it towards your average player, this results in like the bulk of the currency that they're going to earn for the day. So it really motivates them to want to do these tasks. The other nice thing with these daily quests is that it might motivate them to engage in a system that otherwise they wouldn't. And because of engaging in it, they might discover that they actually enjoy the system. So there's a lot of nice benefits, not only from your daily quest, but these other systems in the achievement system tier that motivate players to explore the entirety of your game, thus allowing you to get the most out of all the content that you create. Our last type of um, examples will come from our live events. And the first one that I can think of are seasonal content distribution. So with this system, you're creating a system to more easily integrate seasonal events into the game. Often this has like a designated space in your world or a designated flow that every time you're releasing that holiday content, um, you can run your players through the same flow that they always know and get them through that content quicker. Um, the second type is a map overhaul. So this comes in two forms. One, you simply update the map and release it when it's winter time, as an example. The second would be, you know, something maybe we saw from Jailbreak a few months ago where they had an entire event surrounding it and they blew up the world. And when the players logged back in, there was a whole new world to explore. So you can decide how to do that. There's benefits to both. One is if you want it to be less disruptive, then you just update the world, but it shows your players that you care. The other is when you want to get everybody on your server at the same time to create those viral moments. That would be your motivation for doing that. Third type of live event uh, content might come in the form of rare spawns. So these are any enemies, items, features that rarely appear in the game, but that you make known to players will show up at some time. So often with this, you're going to motivate players to want to coordinate with each other to search down this, this rare spawn and complete it together. Um, and again, going back to it, this is a great way to facilitate both communication and social interaction among your players. Um, any questions on that stuff before we move on to closing thoughts? Yep, I can cover those. So lots of good questions here. So Tech Spectrum asks, for a game that's already doing live ops, what pattern do you see being the highest performing when it comes to planning, scheduling, and releasing updates among and outside of Roblox? So typically what I'll see is, and again, this depends on the bandwidth that your team has. If you can't sustainably do weekly updates as well as a major update, then don't do bi-weekly you know, content updates or monthly updates while you're working on this major expansion. But what I'll see is optimally, if you can do a weekly or bi-weekly regular content update, you release new furniture, new skins, something else, while you have your programmers focus on this major update, that's ultimately where you win. Because 
you can think of content cadence kind of as this base number through which your game expansion is going to multiply. Let's say for nice round numbers, you have a thousand concurrents. And when you release a major update, you're going to 3x that population. So you're going to go from 1,000 to 3,000. Well, content cadence is going to keep your number at that 1,000 while you're working on your major expansion. However, if you're not doing those content cadence updates, players are going to drop off as there's nothing new in the game. And then maybe you release your game expansion at 500 players, right? So you're going to 3x that, and you're going to get 1,500 players, right? So rather than getting the extra 2,000 players from maintaining that player base where you went from 1,000 to 3,000, now you're only getting 500 additional players playing your game because you went from 500 to 1,500, right? So that's how that dynamic works between the two is you're trying to maintain that player base over time. That way, when you release that update, not only are they there to enjoy it, but through their own excitement, they're going to share it out to other players, which is going to make your game even more of a viral explosion when you release that update. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thunder1222 asks, if people don't like your core loop, is it possible to fix it? Is the game just a flop? It definitely is. Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a game called Adopt Me that had a core loop where you could be a parent or a child. And basically, the parents didn't have a core loop unless they had a child to take care of. Well, because of that, they decided to go back to the drawing board and address the core loop. So they actually had, I guess, what you could call a game expansion where they wanted to fix their core loop. And out of that came the pet update. So that is actually a very rare exception. I wouldn't say that you always go after that. But in that case, they decided, OK, we want to make a better core loop for our game. And they went after that. So if you identify that your core loop is not fun, that is definitely your number one priority that you want to fix before you even get into content updates or major expansions for your game. But you could treat one of your major expansions as your team going back to the drawing board and fixing that experience for your game. Great. This one's from me, Dan. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for addressing a tumor feature in a live game? Yeah, so there's a few ways that you can do that. The first is that you can try and work on an update that better incorporates it into the core loop. So if we went back to the Fight Club example that I gave, maybe instead of giving the player the option of going to class or Fight Club, you then incorporate Fight Club as a secret class or a class at the end of the day. So school ends and now you can go to Fight Club afterwards, right? So now it's actually baked into your core loop where it's essentially a class for the day, which is Fight Club. So that's one way you can do it. If you find that it's too obstructive to your game, you can simply rip it out as well. I mean, that's going to be a tougher Band-Aid to rip off. But ultimately, and we're going to get to this later when we're talking about supporting your feature, but if there is something that is detrimental to your game, no matter what you anticipate the reception to be from your players, you should always think about the long-term health of your game. So like the short-term outburst from your players uh, is not even worth the long-term health of your game, right? Yeah, great example of that. All right, Prime Hyde asks, if there is a tumor in your game, but there are vast numbers of players in your community that enjoy it a lot, would it be better to build a core loop around that or remove it in order to focus on the main core loop? Yeah, similar to the, the question I just answered, but I would try and find a way to incorporate it in your current core loop. If, you know, this is something that's been out in the wild for a while and it's actually more popular than your current core loop, maybe you incorporate your current core loop into that and make that your core loop. You kind of have to do like, a damage assessment there of ultimately what's going to be best for the health of your game. But that's ultimately for you to decide, like what is your vision for your game and what direction that you want to go in order to decide like which way you go with that. But just because you went out the gate with one core loop doesn't mean you're stuck with it for life. You can always reevaluate that over time, but ultimately at the core of that decision should be what would players prefer and what's going to create the best experience. All right. So in that same vein, Thunder1222 asks, what makes a good core loop? Simplicity, good gameplay, et cetera. Yeah, so I would say simplicity um, is number one. Like, How easy is it to get into? Um, how enjoyable is it to do? But then the other factor to it is, what systems do you have supporting that core loop? Right, Your core loop 
while it is the thing that they're doing every minute, it's not necessarily the star of the show, right? Your systems that are supporting it are. Nobody talks about how they enjoyed the core loop for World Zero. They talk about how this one boss fight was really fun. And a part of that, what contributed to that was the simplicity of the core loop of what they did to get there. But then once they're in that moment of that boss fight with the different mechanics, how to dodge, when to heal, et cetera, that's what creates those moment of joys for players. So you should think of your core loop as like this essential piece of content, but really it's there to augment the like systems that are in your game that actually are the enjoyable parts for your players. Awesome. All right, final question. Gnome Code asks, would having different core loops always be a bad idea? For example, in World Zero, let's say they added a merchant mechanism where you can buy and sell things at town for profit. I would not set out to make that your goal as the developer of the game because you more often than not are going to create an unintentional rift in your player base where they're essentially playing two different games. Now, if you're more of like a sandbox game and ultimately you want players to choose their own adventure, you can give some thought to that. Maybe there's some overarching sort of core loop that everybody's involved with, but the way that they engage with it is slightly different. Um, but you should try and focus on a single core loop and then if players want to create their own experiences, they can. So maybe a common one is to, to leverage your example. Let's say that uh, World Zero releases an auction house system and one player decides that the only thing they like doing in the game is to stand around the auction house, buy things for super cheap and sell them for a profit. And that's really fun for them. That's great, but like you shouldn't be creating you know, more content for that. That's just an, an observed behavior of that player that they really enjoy. But the majority of the players that are playing World Zero are not playing for the auction house system. They're playing to get better gear to fight bigger monsters. So you shouldn't like prohibit players from creating their own experiences in game. They're always going to do that, but you should try and keep your focus on your development on that core loop that you have. Great info, Dan, thank you. That 